And first of all, I hope you've all had a very, very lovely week. Uh, I know we've come down to Friday and I'm glad that you've all come in today and I do appreciate um, that you've all attended today. Um, so my name is Simran Jeet Singh. Um, some of you may have heard a few of my lectures before. Uh, I'm an optometrist by profession. Uh, I'm 24, probably only a few years older than every, everybody here. Um, but uh, I mean, I studied at Aston. I'm from the Midlands anyway, so I've trekked quite far for you guys today and I hope you will learn a lot but any questions at any point any clarity you, you require let me know I mean we're all similar similar age don't be fooled by my appearance where we're all one anyway um, so during my university time um, did optometry but uh, took an interest in, in Sikhi but generally in terms of history politics and philosophy now um, yeah we, we had a, a Sikh society back uh, at Aston as well which I engaged in uh, but also got involved in the Labour Club, the Optics, uh, and even in the Palestinian group at uni. So when you are at uni, you've got plenty of opportunities to, to kind of better yourself, to learn more, and to get properly involved. So do definitely take every opportunity you get. Now, we are in November. Um, as many as many, many will know, Indra Gandhi was uh, assassinated by Bhyam Singh and Safwan Singh, 31st of October, 1984 which led to a genocide in the streets of Delhi, in many, many different localities outside of the Sikh stronghold of Punjab. Um, and many of you will be marking um, that sort of anniversary. Um, and even if we look at it, 38 years ago wasn't very, very long at all. Now, I was born in 98, some of you are maybe older, maybe younger. But even when we talk about 1984, it's something which is still in our psyche. Even if you open up a newspaper, you'll probably hear about 1984 anyway, you'll hear about the word Khalistan, um, and what have you. Even last year, I mean, we had a referendum in London, which some of you may have attended, which is currently in Canada. Uh, and even generally, if, if you pick up the Tribune uh, newspaper, a newspaper from Punjab, generally every week you'll, you'll find something related to 1984 and uh, to the Sikh independence movement. Now today, my title is The Six at War, uh, what came after. So generally today, uh, and even during my own research, uh, during my university time, I kind of looked at 1984. It's a topic which many, many of you will hear about, but there's a lot of information which perhaps isn't in the mainstream media, and you will perhaps won't really come across it. So during my, my second year back in 2018, um, I started trying to find out more, uh, going to museums, reading books, collecting books, um, finding old um, individuals who were involved in the movement, and today you'll, you'll find uh, a few bits of it. Now, if we look at Sikh history anyway, now the main point I'm going to be bringing across to everybody today is that it's kind of, life is kind of like a novel, where you'll have a plot, you'll have a bunch of characters, and once we get towards the end of a cycle, you have more people coming along. They may look different, but they have a similar kind of instinct, a similar philosophy, and they will be coming back and basically engaging um, in, in what the people have done before. Even if we look at um, contemporary Sikh history, if we look at Sanjay Nair Singh Ji, defending Khamanda Sahib, you'll make that link of Baba Deep Singh, who similarly, perhaps 200 years before, had um, protected the Khamanda Sahib, and even later on, you have uh, Bible Bhagwan Singh as well. Um, so generally, history repeats, and it will repeat, and it will repeat. Now, as students of, um, of a Sikh background, Punjabi background, now I'm not a historian by, by profession or whatever, but it's something which, after work, after a long day, I'm like, you know what, let's pick up a book, let's try and read. Um, and so today, hopefully, it will be informative. I will be connecting a lot of dots. I will be kind of bringing history to you in, in the present. History has already been happened before, but I'll be bringing that narrative to you today in a, in a sort of a, in a very different way. Now, um, so you've had a, perhaps a quick look at the um, kind of my title, and some of you are probably wondering, who are the individuals here? Now, generally, we will know of Indira Gandhi. Now, we are in the UK, so I will be bringing a lot of UK Sikh history in, in as well. Now, the gentleman on the, on the right of Indira Gandhi is the gentleman called Hardit Singh Malik. Now, um, you'll be able to find a book of his, an autobiography, but he was actually in the RAF. And he was actually a pilot in World War I. So he had his education here um, in the UK and, and even in Cambridge. A lot of Norjuan in the early 1900s, a lot, a lot of youngsters came here for an education. Similarly, Hadid Singh Malik came as well. But then later on, he actually became um, the ambassador of India to France after partition 
um, and the creation of the Indian Union. Now, he actually came to Shepherd's Bush, Gurdwara, Central Gurdwara, Karlsjata, um, in the early 1950s. So, a bit of a link straight away for you. Now, generally, the gentleman next to him is Maharaja Yadav, Yadavindra Singh of Patiala. Now, we have Maharaja Ranjit Singh, who many of you will, will have heard of. But even if we look at Maharaja Ranjit Singh, perhaps from Afghanistan down to Lahore, uh, down to Amritsar. But Amritsar to Delhi, you have a completely different geographical area. Now, during the time of Ranjit Singh, you had a few sort of um, king, Sikh kings who um, weren't aligned to Ranjit Singh. They had supported the British, but similarly, they had their own kind of kingdom. And similarly, when, when, the, when the, um, the Sikh Raj got annexed by the British in 1849, the British had taken Dilip Singh, who we all know about, the Gobinu Diamond. Similarly, you had that gentleman who continued in Patiala, um, and he, he, he ruled. And even his dad, Bhavinda Singh of Patiala, he actually kind of um, gave money towards the Central Gurdwara in Shepherd's Bush. So a very, very powerful uh, family. And even recently, there was actually a diamond uh, which he um, had worn, which a famous actress had actually worn recently, um, which some of you may have seen on social media. The next gentleman, Master Dara Singh, who some of you may have heard of, um, sort of uh, a very, very strong Sikh political leader who kind of dom dominated from the 1900s up until um, the 1960s. And he played a very, very important role in sort of bringing about a Sikh political conscious consciousness. The gentleman on the right is somebody who actually lives in Birmingham, in Winston Green. Now, during 1984, the Sikhs in the UK had kind of formed a government in exile, which is kind of that we've, we've decided we're, we're going to go for independence, and he was actually given the Prime Minister of um, the Republic of Khalistan, a Sikh state, um, which we'll talk about as well. Now, 50 years before him, you had somebody who actually looked quite similar to him, and similarly he had um, gone for... Um, sort of the Sikh independence. Now down at the bottom, you actually have posted stamps and dollars which were actually distributed around um, sort of uh, Canada and America and even here, which were basically to propagate the idea of an independent Sikh uh, state. Okay, now I want to pay homage to Sam Deja Singh um, and some information at the very top. Um, and he's actually the, the first president at the Central Gurdwara, uh, which is, isn't too far from here. Uh, but, I mean, a hundred years ago, he would have been here. He would have been lecturing at the Gurdwara. He would have been, perhaps being like me and you, he would have been a student at Cambridge, and um, he sort of um, spoke about Sikhi and basically led a, a good community pivotal role. Um, now, I've got a few more quotes here today. Um, I've got a, a, sort of a few lines of Professor Bordensinger, a poet, um, he was around 100 years ago. Definitely do check out his work. Um, but he, he, he sort of writes um, in a very biblical manner, but he brings a lot, a lot of Sikh principles to the forefront. And even to the far right, um, generally in my lecture today, it's mainly in memory of everybody, but all of the, the Sikhs who were made Shaheed in 1984. Um, and they are coined Shaheed, for they are martyrs of uh, the Sikh form. Okay? Right, now, as I mentioned before, we spoke about Patiala, so we spoke about Ranjit Singh and his empire, and we spoke about the, the kings who were aligned to the British. Now, a bit of back history, so if we look at Gurdwara Singh Ji's period, we had a gentleman called Banda Singh Bahadur, who kind of avenged the Shahidi, the martyrdom of the Jar Seher Jale. From that particular point on, they had created a very, very small nation state, as we would kind of look at it in the modern sense, where they kind of distributed um, papers and documentation, and it was all stamped and even coins. Now, even if you look at perhaps even in your pocket, you'll, you'll have five pound, 10 pound, and it'll have the monarch of that particular time. And similarly, during that particular period, having currency, having your own name, is an indicator that you have political power. And Banda Singh Bahadur did pretty much exactly that. Um, unfortunately, he was made Shaheed in 1716. So we had ruled as a people for about 10 years, uh, but unfortunately the Mughal power was very, very strong for, for our sort of the Sikh revolution. Uh, and he called it Shahidi. Now even in our Sikh, even if you look at an overview, Gurwajan Devji was made Shahid, Gurudev Bahadurji, you know, the, the, even the Jah Sahib Jah the Banda Singh Bahadur. In our history, you, you will find that there are blood, blood stains on every page. And that continues when we talk about 1984, even partition. 
And for us to be where we are now, the way we look, a lot of blood has actually been spilt. But coming back to, to, the, to the little, little history here today, now generally we are one collective, we are a bump. But in that particular bump, I might have a different opinion to you and to you, and, but that doesn't mean that we can't get along. Now, unfortunately, back in that particular period, um, a lot of the, the Sikh princes, the Sikh kings, have wanted to keep hold of their power. So they had said to Ranjit Singh that, no, we're not going to join you, but we're actually going to join the British. And the British at that time, the East India Company, were getting very, very strong. Now, Raja Bhag Singh um, was from an area called Jin, where you'll actually be able to spot on the map, which is kind of quite near to Ludhiana, if you can kind of try and visualise that on the particular map. So you had Patiala, Jin, you had Faridkot, Napa, many, many different areas of princely states where they were in fact kind of de facto in control, but the British were right behind them. And even if you look at the, the uncle, Raja Bhag Singh, he had passed back to the Jeet Singh very, very early on, but when it came to the crunch, he decided to support the British. Now, when his grandson came along, he tried to go back to the Jeet Singh. I mean, you're, you're, my, uh, you're one of my family members. The British did not like it. Now, the British have known that, okay, if we get everybody here in one grouping, one viewpoint, there could be havoc. And even when they took over the Sikh Empire in 1849, what did they do? They took over the Gurdwara control, and they had managed to control Harmandar Sahib, the Bar Sahib, and many, many of the Gurdwara. And they had kind of put in their own people. And it took until the 1920s for us to liberate our Gurdwara. So if you can imagine, for about 70 years, we perhaps didn't have control of our own institutions, our Gurdwara. They're not really places of worship, but they're an institution where we learn, we read Gurbani, but in terms of that mental state and that physical state, we become kind of the ideal citizen that we need to become. And 1849, unfortunately, a lot of treachery um, in Ranjit Singh period. Ranjit Singh had passed away in 1839. He had many, many children, many, many wives, many, many daughters as well. Uh, but unfortunately, two battles were um, sort of faced with the first Anglo Sikh War in 1845 to 46, and the second one, 1848 to 1849, where unfortunately a lot of the um, Singh Sardars who had fought in Rajit Singh's army, they had kind of put down their weapons uh, and said, okay, we, we surrender. But now, even when we talk about Rajit Singh's period, we've got to remember that we were a minority in population. Even if you look at the modern day, the Indian state, we are perhaps 2% of our whole population. Even in Punjab, prior to partition, um, you, you have to remember that we, we perhaps had a lot of more Muslims, Hindus in that particular area. And we were perhaps a minority. And, and that's perhaps why when the idea came that, okay, the Muslim are going to go from Pakistan, uh, and perhaps the idea came that, okay, the British are perhaps willing to give you your own territory, but where are you a majority? Unfortunately, in the modern day, you need to have a population, you need to have numbers, unless you've got diplomacy like Ranjit Singh had. And Ranjit Singh, even if you read up on him, a lot of the times, any sort of dispute, you would manage it accordingly. You wouldn't take their heads off, you would give them a jagid and say, okay, look, we, we have a, a, a bit of a, a mutual dis, uh, sort of a misunderstanding. So to see Elo, you take that, and we will continue what we do. Okay? But 1849, now, a lot of our community had perhaps said, okay, enough is enough. But we have to remember that a lot of people did not. And that's where you have a few groupings of individuals and, and groups who were, were like, we, we are not going to surrender. And that's perhaps the Sikhi way. Even if we look at 1984, June Jalassi, which we'll talk about a bit later on, Sanjay Nesingji, um, I mean, he passed had many, many opportunities, and people will point fingers and say, why didn't you leave the bar side? If you had left the bar side, the Indian army would not have invaded, which um, the few points which I will speak about later will kind of clear that from your mind. But he had the last stand. Even Baba Deep Singh, even during, um, in, in 1762, now as I've mentioned, we have bloodstains, in our history, and that will continue to be. But we actually had a, a genocide in 1762, uh, which is kind of called the Vada Talugara, where um, Sikhs were literally butchered and massacred in very, very high numbers, and, and our community at that particular point ended up being very, very small. But what happened a few years later, in 1765, 
Jai Sa Singh Alwalia and Maharaja Ranjit Singh's granddad, Sarbad Jarad Singh, they actually take Lahore in 1765. So generally, whenever a community is sort of pushed down, they will rise up. Even Guru Gobind, Gaur Gobind Singh's period, Jai Sahib Jarad Shahid, Banda Singh Bahad, that comes, comes straight up. You know, and even Guru Arjun Dev Ji Shahidin, and you have Guru Har Gobind, who establishes the Akal Tak and creates a political nation uh, and gives Sikhs um, sort of Miri and Biri that yes, you've got to be that spiritually minded, but when the, when the time comes, if need be, you need to take up arms and you need to defend yourself and your sort of your community. So back um, in 1849, you had, had the group thing called the Nam Dadis. And you had um, a few descendants, actually, of Guru Nanak Dev Ji, um, who you can read down at the bottom as well. Uh, and they declared a holy war against the British. So generally, even if we look at perhaps an exam, which we may fail, I mean, we could be like, okay, oh, we failed it, we're not going to study again. Or you can continue rising, do more revision and pass it. And similarly, revolution is now blood from even Guru Nanak Dev Ji, but when he told the Brahmins, I'm not going to be wearing your filler. Uh, and questioned. Um, and even during Guru Hargobind's time, by time with the Mala, by time with the Star, and saying that my devotees, my, my sort of followers, I mean, we are born kings and princesses. Um, we, we don't accept your kind of your crown. And similarly, even in the modern day today, okay, yeah, we pay taxes, but do, do we, to what extent do we agree um, in terms of the government and how they're acting and whether we, we feel it's correct or not. But in terms of for a Sikh, a Sikh will only back to Guru Maharaj, nobody else. And that's what, what they kind of um, practically did. Now generally, the, unfortunately the British had got caught of a lot of the, uh, the revolutionaries and for many of them they were actually sent to, uh, they were basically sent out of Punjab. And if you look at the gentleman by Maharaj Singh on the far left, um, he was a very, very spiritual um, Sikh saint, but also a soldier. Uh, and he continued uh, the revolution until, unfortunately, when you are outnumbered against such a huge army, and bearing in mind that perhaps you have traits in your own kind of corner, he was unfortunately sent over to uh, Singapore. But even if you look at what the British actually write about him, and, um, and what's quoted, um, that he is, he, is na he is to natives what Jesus Christ would be to Christians. And you can kind of work out what that sort of power is. Now generally, as six, we, we can aspire to that sort of level. When Guru Gobind Singh Ji had given uh, the Panch Biyare, Amrit Didad, Khandini Bol, similarly he had taken that same initiation from the Panch Biyare. And generally, if we look at our own sort of our community, we have Guru Granth Sahib Ji, and we also have the Guru Panta Khalsa, which is everybody a collective. And even back in those days, if there was a problem back in the community, a collective decision would be made. Even in the, in the 17th and the 18th century, prior to Ranjit Singh, if, if there were invaders coming into the Punjab, how were we going to react? What were we going to do? And a Galtak um, is a sort of an institution which is in the Darbar Sahib complex. And generally, when you go to the Darbar Sahib, you'll hear Girtan. But when you go down to a Galtak, you'll hear Dadiwana, which are ballads of, uh, of martyrdom or Shahidi, uh, to kind of keep that energetic power. And even in terms of the actual kind of form of the Galtak, it's facing Delhi. It's facing Delhi Darbar. And generally, Indra Gandhi and sort of the Indian army knew that if we take down the Akal Takht, then we are, we're given a strong sort of a political opinion that if you're go you are only going to accept Delhi, forget your Akal Takht, it's a Delhi who you should be bowing to. And uh, I'm going to speak a bit more about that anyway. Right, and if we go down to the 1900s, so we've spoken about two revolutionary groups, we have one more. So generally, even though we were under sort of occupation from the British, a lot of individuals had continued that spark of revolution that we are sovereign people, everybody is sovereign, but we have our own distinct identity, we are a political nation. Um, and they continued, and, and this particular gentleman, Bai Balwan Singh, I mean, many of you will probably have heard of Ashid Udham Singh and Michael O'Dwyer, and General Dyer as well, but even if you read that little account of how much, how, how scared the British were, and coming back to it, even if you look at the Christian missionaries, post of the British era, I mean, they had even built a church in the, in the Darbar Sahib complex. And even if you look at um, even the British, 
they had actually kind of authored a, a English translation of Gurbani, of Guru Granth Sahib Ji. So they had an idea of where we were. And they understood that in terms of the power of a Sikh, you get from your Guru and you get from the collective. And if you, if you keep that going, even if you look at the, in, in World War I, World War II, you'll notice that they only really took on Gestari Singhs who, who had taken Amrit. And generally, in each kind of regiment, you have a, you have a Granthi Singh. And they knew that if, they rem if the, Brit the British knew that if the Sikhs had remained um, in, in their, sort of their belief system, they, they, wouldn't, they won't wander away. And even if you look at in our Sikh history, that bravery which is kind of displayed on every time period by many, many individuals, that is what keeps us going. Now generally, I mean, I, I see a lot of board the stars today anyway by a lot of the, the young things here. And generally, we get a lot of power and a lot of history from, from the period after 1984 where a guerrilla movement, a, a sort of um, a war of independence had continued. And similarly, even if you look at Bhai Maharaj Singh and Bhai Ram Singh Gupta, Similarly, they had adopted a similar appearance and they had kind of continued their revolutionary movement until they perhaps they, they passed away. And similarly, that's a connection you can make in terms of from 200 years apart, 100 years apart, but it's continuing that same dynamic that we are an independent nation. Right, so coming back down to partition before we, we hit 1980. So yes, I mean, we have spoken very, very briefly regarding the, the ideal of a six state. Now, in our history, we have had our, our own political kind of uh, state before. We have had our kingship, we have had our Raj. And even if, you look at, even if you look at the Sikh history from the Guru period, what every Guru had kind of established was kind of their own kind of settlement. Even if you look at Amritsar, if you look at where Dalbar Sahib is, I mean, back, back in the 80s, 70s, you would have lines of markets. So the Guru knew that if you want to create kind of a state in a state, even if you look at the Vatican, the Vatican is a state in a state. I visited down to Monaco recently, and similarly, they, they, though they are kind of geographically um, in France, they have their own kind of state. And similarly, the Bar Sahib, that's how the Guru had create, created it. Even if you look at Guru Nanak Devji, and you had Kartarpur, which is currently in, in modern day Pakistan. And some of you may have heard of the kind of the langa, that, that kind of a corridor where Sikhs who were living in India can freely pass over um, and, and do darshan of that particular kind of uh, that kind of area. Um, so generally, it's about nation building, and that's what Guru Har Gobind and even Guru Gobind Singh had cemented come 1699. But coming back to we've spoken about the population. Now, ideally, our Sikh leaders have known that. Okay, we can side alongside Muhammad Jinnah um, and we can join Pakistan, but then our future could be very, very different. Now, there was actually one particular meeting of these four individuals. Now, we've spoken about Master Dara Singh, we've spoken about Hardet Singh Malik, who fought in World War One. we've spoken about the Maharaja of Padiala, and the gentleman over to his left was an Akali Dar leader named Jani Kartar Singh. And now, they had actually met Muhammad Jinnah. Um, prior to partition, and Muhammad Jinnah had said that whatever you want, I will give. Um, which, unfortunately, the Sikhs, the Sikh leaders weren't really wavered by. But the problem was, coming back to population, we weren't really a, a large population in any particular area. And so when partition came, when Pakistan was going to be made, partition was pretty much evident. That's when our leaders had said, okay, we need to have our own independent state. But unfortunately, due to the population, the British perhaps didn't really take it um, very in, in the way perhaps they should have. And the reason why we perhaps didn't go to Pakistan was due to our very, very long history uh, alongside uh, the Mughals, where we had faced many, many years of persecu persecution um, and even slavery to, to some extent. Um, and so, yes, we had joined the Indian Union. Right, and here's actually a photo of Master Dara Singh um, in the early 50s at a Gurdwara in Manchester. And so yes, prior, well, after partition, the Sikhs had, we didn't actually sign um, sort of the Indian constitution. Now the Indian constitution does not recognize our, our collective as an independent people. It kind of looks at us uh, as a long-haired Hindu, that we are a form of a Hindu. So they don't recognize that independent kind of nature that we have. And so when we couldn't perhaps establish our independent state, 
we have continued um, struggling for sort of an autonomous unit in the Punjab, which kind of would be a state in a state. Um, unfortunately, that did not kind of materialise. And during that time, 1950s, 60s, we have, our leaders have kind of worked out that, okay, if we are going to survive as a political entity, we need to continue fighting for our independence in whatever form it may look like. Now, a bit more history. So we've spoken about the Akali Dal. Now, Akali means immortal. Now, back in, in sort of Gurdwara Singh's time, and even afterwards, we had a grouping called the Nehangs, who would call themselves Akali, that they were immortal. And generally, when you take Kundalini board, when you become uh, an Amritari Singh, say, or, or, or a Kaur, that's when you, you, you become immortal, that in terms of your head is to your Guru, that whatever you do, perhaps in your Jeevan, will reflect the Gurbani teachings and, and the way which we live our life. But a bit more of history. So Master Tara Singh was the leader of the Akali Dal. Later down, you had a gentleman called Sant Fadlis Singh who had led Sikh politics. That photograph is from 1962 and coming back down to Central Gurdwara, Karl Sajjabha. And just a, a photograph I took on Sunday. Um, so coming back to it, really, um, it came to an era where our, our leaders have decided that we really need to go for, for our independence. And at that particular time in the Indian Union, states were being created on their linguistic basic, uh, on, on their kind of what, what language they kind of speak in. But unfortunately, the whole of India was getting reorganized into different states, but Punjab was uh, in, in the original form. So partition, you have the Pakistan Punjab, but wherever you had afterwards, Haryana, Himachal, if you look on, onto the map, I mean, the Punjabi Subha didn't come about till 1966. Now, unfortunately, coming back down to population, the Indian government, unfortunately, had continued wanting that Hindu vote. Now, coming back to population, we are 2%. Now, we perhaps don't really have that political leverage that we can give a prime minister, we can give a party a ton of votes because we're very, very much concentrated in the Punjab. Yes, we are all over India, but generally, we have always kind of been in the Punjab. Now, here is actually a demonstration video from November 1969. and we're, we're having a protest against the Indian government, remarkable. But coming back to the actual individual, so we hadn't received the, the kind of the linguistic Punjabi kind of state which we wanted. And unfortunately, a gentleman by the name of Dershan Singh Fernamar actually went, actually went on a hunger strike and he actually passed away after a hundred or so days of being on that hunger strike. And the Indian government did not budge. Now generally, even if we look at prior to 84, whatever demands the second nation, the Punjabi nation had at that critical junction, that had continued, but the Indian government, government had made no allowance. And even during that particular time, who was Prime Minister? Indira Gandhi was Prime Minister. And we've got one more video. Okay, so um, here's a photograph of Doshan Sikhvaraman. And so he had made an advice to, to Guruji to, to say that um, Give me, give me strength that I will be able to um, complete my, uh, my hunger strike. If I, if I die, I die. If not, that's all in your hands. So we all live by that hukum, that whatever will happen is already preordained. Um, and it's remarkable, something which happens back in Punjab in 69, where no internet, no mobile phones, and you have that connection. And people here will demonstrate in central London. Uh, and even yesterday, some of you may have come down to the Free Juggy Now protest, um, and very similar again. But if you can imagine, we, had, we have social media now where people from all over the country can come. But yeah, 69, and when we still have a protest uh, occurring. It's an effigy of Indira Gandhi, which later they had actually burned outside the Indian High Commission in Powerwick and some of the, uh, the Akali Dal UK leaders involved. Uh, and so that particular uh, continued, um, the Pradhan of the Akali Dal had similarly gone on a hunger strike. And it comes back down to that defiance that we're gonna stand for what's right, and we're gonna take it to the very end. 
Um, and that's that same psyche which you continue to see, that you may be against all art, but what's right is what you stick to. And a bit more UK sick history now, we can wear our Dastana, we can wear our Kogada very, very easily now, uh, especially in universities, but back in the 60s, 70s, 50s, life would have been very, very difficult for the way you look. Um, and even back then, um, many, many sort of companies, a company in Wolverhampton, a sort of a, a rubber tire factory, good year company, and even on the Wolverhampton buses, they would not allow you to keep your beard or to wear your design at all. Um, and that kind of gives you an insight. But relating to even sort of the, the bot sort of paragraph and what we're talking about, now, okay, if we, if we are in India, then we would expect India to come in and to be our voice in Britain and many, many different countries. But maybe the Indians weren't too forward uh, thinking regarding that, and perhaps they had left it alone, and perhaps not had completed the role that maybe they should have ought to have completed. And that leads now to, we've spoken about that desire to reclaim that freedom, that azadi. Now, tracing the form of Khalistan as we see it um, in the modern day, um, it's a very, very long history. But the first kind of mention of it actually came in 1971 in the New York Times. And a gentleman, a doctor by the name of Jitjit Singh Chahan, who actually, uh, a doctor by profession, he actually studied here in, in London in the late 60s. Um, and I uh, can't fully remember which degree, um, but he had studied here. He was actually a member of the Akali Dal, and was actually the finance minister of the Punjab government. So he was an elected official. And coming back to Master Dara Singh, they had worked out, okay, we haven't received our independence, we need to continue fighting for that. And this particular gentleman, um, who actually had family here in London in the early 70s, he had put up a, an advertisement in 1971, proclaiming the idea of an independent state. And 1971, that's many, many years before 1984 when perhaps the, the conversation started. And what we have over here, the photographs are from Nangana, say, back in 1971. The two gentlemen down here are actually from Birmingham. And we have a gentleman called Jan Singh Bunji. Now, if any of you are familiar with uh, Tsoho Road, you have um, a Gurdwara called Baba Deep Singh. And it's kind of a Yadgar Gurdwara. And that was actually set up by the gentleman Jan Singh Bunji. Here's a quotation from him in 1971. Now, we've all heard of Jukdar Singh Johal, and we perhaps have heard of many, many political prisoners around the whole world. But in terms of Jukdar Singh Johal, we had a gentleman called Gyani Bakshi Singh. Now, he was an Akali Dal, and, and at that particular period, the, the, the individuals had understood politically where we are, where we need to go to. And he actually uh, had spoken very, very clearly in Punjab, even here, that we need to continue fighting for an independent six state. Now, very, very similar to Jagdar Singh Joha, who was very, very vocal online, similarly, he was actually incarcerated in a jail in Punjab for a whole year. A whole year, another British citizen. Now, times were very, very different politically, where perhaps the British uh, and the Indians, perhaps the British had a bit more leverage. Unfortunately, now, due to Brexit and what have you, the Indians have perhaps a bit more of a bargaining power. Um, and obviously perhaps the British are on their knees at the moment, which has perhaps never really been the case in, in history. And after a year, uh, and there was sort of a, a huge debate in the House of Commons, and later on he was freed from incarceration, um, and, and he was actually a British citizen again. Um, and here's a photograph of him after a year in Dudley Town Hall in the Midlands. Right, and then we spoke about, so that all occurred in 1972. Nangana said 1971, the advertisement in 1971 as well. Now if we come to 1972, now even if we look at the Polish, during World War II, they actually created a government in exile. Um, and they actually had their main sort of um, office actually in London, which you can perhaps Google, and they actually have a very, very good display outside. Now, generally, when a country is under occupation, whoever's in that particular community, they need to go elsewhere to continue that struggle. And similarly, even if you look at Maharaja Dalip Singh, now Maharaja Dalip Singh was outside of Punjab, he was in Britain, and then later on had, had made his way to Russia. He had created his own government in exile at that particular point, and a gentleman by the name of Thakur Singh Sundanwalia, who was very, very important in the Singh Sabha movement, 
So we spoke about the Nam Dharis, we spoke about that revolutionary edge after the annexation of Punjab, but because you had the Christian missionaries, you had sort of the Hindu Arya Samaj, you had a lot of resurgence and a lot of education was needed. And that's when the Singh Sabha movement came and they started publishing magazines, history about um, the Sikh idea, Sikh history, and um, there's, yeah, you can read a lot about that. But back in 1972, the Mington Spa, um, we had a huge convention and they uh, moved for a government in exile. Now, if we make our way down to um, sort of 1984, now, prior to 1971 to 84, the human rights violations were picking up and politically we had sticked to our idea that either give us independence or even what Sanjay Nersindji would say often, if you want to keep us in your country, treat us at that same level. Now, unfortunately, the, the, as I've mentioned, we were a minority 2%. The government will care about votes. Even here, even Labour Conservative, they want your votes. It's not about what you can deliver or who you are. It's if you've got money and if you've got leverage and if, you, if you've got that voting majority, if you've got that population. Now, in 1984, many of you know what happened. I won't really be touching too much upon that. But just to give you a bit of background anyway, so Indira Gandhi, 1975, she came back into power. She created an emergency period where she didn't kind of um, resign. She had basically put all of the political opponents, opponents in jail and kind of led to a kind of a media blackout. And so generally people um, in India and outside of the whole world wouldn't actually know what was going on. And similarly, when that happened, the Akali Dal leaders in the UK, they had similarly protested again. Back in Punjab, going back down to that revolutionary psyche that whatever's right, we will stick to, whatever's wrong, we will not, and we will not obey it. And similarly, uh, demonstrations back in Punjab had occurred. And then we came to a period where we had created a document, okay, Punjabi Subhad, we have Punjabi Subhad to an extent, it's not what we want, here's what we want, in the form of a document called the Ananda Side Resolution. We spoke about issues which are still very, very prevalent. I mean, many of you know about Siddhu Musawala and his, uh, sort of his final, final song, relating to the Satluj Yumana Canal. And so Punjab, during that particular point, it went over in a green revolution, where farming had changed rapidly, became the breadbasket of India. So the, the most prosperous state at that particular point was actually Punjab. A lot of money was coming in, uh, a lot of um, tractors were being, because farmers were getting a lot more rich, a lot of tractors, uh, radios were coming in, refrigerators a bit later on, so Punjab was kind of the place to be, but unfortunately from that Green Revolution. So even if we look at post-partition anyway, a lot of the fertile Pun Punjabi soil actually went over to East, East Punjab, uh, which is now Pakistan. So we had lost a lot of area, and you've also got to remember, our community is still very, very rich. We are a wealthy community, but we were perhaps a lot more richer back then. So a lot of the refugees who came over to modern day India, they had to kind of begin from scratch. And, uh, and similarly they did, uh, and now even the Sikh community in the Indian state are very, very rich. And that comes back down to our, how we work and our, our work ethic really, where that we are very, very hard workers. And then we obviously believe in this one and, and giving back um, to the need, to the kind of the poor and, and sort of the needy. But coming back down to the late 70s, that's when so we had that document in place and there were many, many kind of, um, kind of discussions from the Akali Dal Sikh leaders who represented Punjab and Indira Gandhi and her party. But coming back down to it, the Indian government will only really care about your vote. If you can vote, great. If you can't, then remember India is very, very large. Punjab is very, very small. 2%, very, very small. And... Uh, kind of talks have continued, and that's when the idea of an independent state really came about in the Punjab in the early 1980s, and that's when we had Sanjay Nersingji. So coming back to, to the Christian missionary type, then you have that Singh Sabha led, where you, we're educating again, here's what it means to be a Sikh. Uh, and similarly, back then in the 70s, perhaps we, as a community, we were losing our way again. We were getting very, very rich, but perhaps in terms of Sikhi, we were perhaps losing it, losing it slightly. And that's where Sanjay Nersingji had gone village to village and told people, um, here's what we should be doing, here's what Guru Granth teaches, here's how you need to live your life. 
Now coming back down to the British, when the Brit so the British had, had kind of taken a, a translation of Guru Granth Sahib Ji, they knew exactly who we are, they knew our history, even if you if you, you may have heard of a kind of an Ittahasak Granth, an Ittahasak text, a, a, a text uh, called Panth Prakash, which is very, very well known, written by a gentleman called Atal Singh Pungu. Um, and he was actually kind of, um, he took the job and it was kind of sort of paid for by the British. So the British were yearning to find out who are these Sikh people, why, have, why could we take them over straight away, what's so special about them? So they knew exactly who we were and, and what we stood for. Similarly, the Indian government had known as well. And coming back down to 1984, so yes, that idea of independence had continued. But fortunately, in our community, we do perhaps have people who kind of want to seek their own benefit. Even during the time of Ranjit Singh, you had um, sort of, after Ranjit Singh, you had his children came aboard, Dilip Singh, Sher Singh, Karak Singh, and unfortunately, you had a lot of intrigue in Maharaja Ranjit Singh's court that I want to be in power, I want to have influence, I want to have money. Kind of the illusion of Maya, where whatever you see, I mean, generally, we all know that our, our main aim in, in, in the life here is to, to, to get to such kind. But whatever comes in between can kind of kind of put a, put a mist in front of you, especially when it comes to sort of the Banj Jord, which we all know about. Now, coming back down to Dr. Jagjit Singh, so the finance minister in the Punjab, um, a gentleman who studied here, a gentleman who would put that advertisement in the New York Times, here is a little quote from him uh, from 1985. Now the photograph here is actually from the Khalas Jaffa again um, in Shepherd's Bush where even if you look at um, Sikh history and in terms of our migration, so generally Canada and sort of London, even when we talk about Harbit Singh Malik, the, the, um, the, the fighter pilot in World War I, London has kind of been that main link and it still is a very, very main link. Even if you look at how big our community is, west to east, going down to Kent, we are still very, very populous in, in London. And London, even during the British Raj era, during the British colonial period, London was a very, very distinctive area and a, and a sign of political, uh, political work. Now here is actually a, le a, a little one minute video which I've translated from Dr. Jukjit Singh Chauhan from 1985. And he kind of talks about um, what led up to the 1950s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So betrayal, betrayal, we saw it during the Rajit Singh period after he had passed away, but even during the 1920s when perhaps the Sikh leaders were very, very closely aligned to the Congress party, to Mahatma Gandhi, and even to uh, Prime Minister Nehru, who was actually the, the dad of Indira Gandhi. Um, so yes, unfortunately, the Indian state had betrayed us. They had said that we will give you whatever you require. We will not make any decisive step unless we have your backing. But times change, as they told us in 1950. And so over to the far left is actually a very, very early map of the Sikh independent state, actually made in 1955 by a gentleman by the name of uh, Sardar Devinder Singh Parmar. Back in 1955, he lived in London as well. And he had, he had basically drawn up a map, um, which kind of looked at the majority Sikh areas uh, and what what could be achieved. Now, 1984 has happened, the bar site has been attacked, um, and 40, uh, 40 to 50 of the Gurdwale, an attack on, on the heart of six around the world. And generally, as we've mentioned, London has been a very, very big area. We have a very, very large population in England, 
and we had a huge rally from Hyde Park down to the Indian High Commission, um, which we do have a video for as well, just to give you an idea of the number. So generally, Sikhs had given many, many sort of kurbanya uh, martyrdom for the Indian state. The Indian state came back in 1950 and said, we have changed our mind. Uh, in short, we don't really care about you, do whatever you want. We continue agitating peacefully.